This time on the Highland Woodworker. And I know just from experience, and I'll still have to correct it, where to place the beginning of the band, and then I wrap it around. Master Woodworker Tim Arnold creates shaker style oval boxes, but with a modern twist. We'll take you to his Nashville, Tennessee workshop and see how he does it. Plus, popular woodworking magazines, tips, tricks, and techniques. Andrew Zollner has the skinny on ripping thin strips safely on a table saw. Join us for these stories and more this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. We're coming to you from Highland Woodworking's live online classroom. Go to highlandwoodworking.com for a schedule of upcoming classes you can take right in the comfort of your home or shop and interact with our growing list of teachers during their presentations. Highland Woodworking always offers the finest tools and a wonderful woodworking education. Hundreds of years ago, a group of like-minded spiritual believers gave up all of their worldly possessions to live communally and worship charismatically by shaking and trembling. The shakers also believed working was a form of worship and built their furniture and utility pieces with perfection and self-sufficiency in mind. Although their work may appear simple, looks can be very deceiving. Woodworker Tim Arnold knows this firsthand and has perfected the craft of creating shaker-style oval boxes. But he likes to, shall I say, shake things up a bit using traditional methods for a modern design. Let's meet Tim Arnold now in our moment with a master. I sort of had a um, moment probably about 10 years ago of what could I do to expand the realm of, of the shaker boxes and still respect what they did. And I, and I, I made the uh, decision that I am going to start putting ornamentation on shaker boxes, which is something that they would not have done. Right. And I first started doing um, exotic veneers, bird's eye, um, other, you know, curly, black uh, yeah. walnut crotch, right. you know, you, you name it, th anything that I thought looked nice, uh, and particularly keeping it with domestic, North American domestic woods. Mm -hmm. And then one of the fringe benefits of being uh, going to art shows, you, you get art buddies that are in different mediums, uh -huh. and one of them was a copper artist, hammered copper artist, and I just started admiring just the uh, the beauty and the organic feel of copper, and I, and it's I call it windshield time when you drive across the country to go to an art show, and you're driving back, and you're just all by yourself, and you're on you're, you're on your fifth cup of coffee, and you're just sort of <laughs> contemplating, and I call it windshield time, and uh -huh. that you can think about eh, what can I do, and I thought. I'm going to get copper sheets and um, laminate them onto a substrata, a wood substrata, and I'm going to put a patina on this copper and see how it sells. And it took off beautifully. And a part of the process is that you have copper scraps. And I kept saving, I, one of these hoarders, like all of us, um, you, you, know, you look at something like, I can't throw that away. I, I wanna, somehow I want to find a use for it. And I had all these copper scraps and I bought a crucible mm -hmm. and a blast furnace. Got this piece of stone completely wet and I would pour the copper out on the stone and it would immediately uh, flash the water molecules into steam and it would create these little pock marks. I, I call them little volcanoes. Then I would let, let these uh, little pieces of copper nuggets, in essence, um, stay out in the in, mother nature for a while and then I would come back and I'd heat them up again and apply different chemicals to create a patina. Mm -hmm. um, from there, attach it and actually this is going to be my first entry of doing one like this. So I have not sold any of these yet. I mean, yeah. folks might enjoy them, might not, we'll see. I've turned some boxes into uh, using old Soviet Nixie tubes as a clock and it, they've gone over well. I, that, I, I, can't keep them in stock. So as far as my entry into Shaker Box, it's not really necessarily that prestigious. It's really a 
potentially a little embarrassing, and I'll tell you how it happened. I, I was working for Home Depot at the time, um, a, an excellent company, but it, it was stressful. And one of the occupational hazards of working for Home Depot mm -hmm. is you start collecting tools. Mm -hmm. It's a great problem. Yeah. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, I would go down to the basement, and build tables, things that I was doing, basically my own design. And this was almost 20 years ago. And my mom um, looked at me and said, Tim, you need to go to uh, Pleasant Hill, Kentucky, the Shaker uh, um, Village, and you need to learn how to make Shaker boxes. And I said, Mom, I love you. I'm an adult. I know what I'm doing. Don't tell me what to do. And like most mothers, she was rather persistent and felt like she had, and does, have the right to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And so at one point, I realized it was futile to resist. <laughs> um, go take um, a cl this class um, on how to make shaker boxes in Pleasant Hill, Kentucky. Make a few boxes, give them to her, case closed, move on and keep doing whatever I want to do, not what other people tell me to do. Sure. So I went to Pleasant Hill. I met this incredibly nice gentleman by the name of John Wilson. Um, he was uh, the, my teacher at the time and in a lot of ways is still my teacher. And I had an epiphany of fall, I immediately fell in love with the, the, just the beautiful shape um, of these boxes and the joy of making them. I called my wife and I said, honey, this might be something I'd like to do um, full time. This is a number five. The bottom right here is one single band that is steamed. Oh, first of all, I cut out the uh, shaker fingers or the swallow fingers here. Swallow fingers. That's what I've heard them referred to back in the day when the shakers were actually making them. Mm -hmm. um, or fingers, just simply fingers, exactly. And nobody knows exactly um, where, uh, what particular shaker came up with this. Uh, these boxes started originating in the Mount Lebanon community around the 1820s. It basically, it's four simple uh, pieces of wood. There's a bottom band, there's a top band, there's a bottom board, there's a top board. Mm -hmm. It's four pieces of wood. And it's extremely simple, but a good box is not easy to make. Um, simple but complex. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and at yeah. times can be frustrating, but it's something that it, through persistence and uh, just getting up and trying it again and again and again, you can start to perfect your uh, processes and become a little bit more accomplished at it. And there's about 17 steps. And one of the steps is you steam the band and you uh, bend it, hopefully successfully. You put in the copper tacks and then you put shapers in the band to maintain the shape while it's drying. And so, particularly in Middle Tennessee at this time of year, when an unair conditioned shop, that might take two days for the band to dry. So, I never start a box in the morning and have it done that afternoon. It, I will do them in batches and um, I will go around to different areas and, and it, sometimes I'll just produce the tops or the top boards. I'll make my own boards. Or sometimes I'll just spend days cutting out fingers. It's not false modesty. I did not, obviously I did not come up with this design. Um, the shakers were incredibly innovative and they were uh, very compassionate, loving, giving people too. But this simple, this incredibly simple design uh, where four pieces of wood can produce something that's very functional, mm -hmm. um, that can be used every day, and um, is seen throughout the world as an American um, classic. Yeah. So. Well, it makes a, a great sewing box. Right. Uh, uh, a, 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 a box, I wonder if they developed them to keep seed in, maybe, or from what I plant remnants, it was dry goods. Everything yeah. from uh, nails, buttons, seeds, oh. anything that to be sorted. Exactly. Yeah. They were very fastidious about organization and things being in the right place. Everything. If you ever go to a shaker community and look at their buildings, they had the pegs along the walls for the mm -hmm. chairs to be placed if they're not being currently sat upon. Mm -hmm. Have the chairs placed on the walls or your coats, and oh. the things need to be in their own location. They also have the copper. Absolutely, That's, that was a, a trademark of theirs as well. And you know, really no one knows where they got their copper tax. The suspicion is that it was probably a, a European connection. Mm -hmm. But that is a classic um, identifying mark 
of the shaker boxes is that they were finished off with copper tacks. And they're all clinched. Yes, um, exactly. And I have down at the shop, I hammer them in and it hits a steel pipe. And so the point of the tack goes through the two layers of wood, hits that steel pipe and then clinches over. Mm -hmm. And it gives that great mechanical um, bond yeah. because you know the wood will expand and contract. Right. Obviously. So there's and no glue here. None. Yeah. None. And, and it's the shaker's ingenious methods. It's not mine. I mean, I, I built this, yeah. uh -huh. but it's, it's their design. <laughs> right. And, right. you know, think about it. I mean, this was built before um, air conditioning, mm -hmm. forced heat systems. And so um, the expansion and contraction in homes can be in some ways more substantial. And I also travel around the United States. Like I w have done shows in Phoenix and Salt Lake City. So you're going from middle Tennessee of jungle environments virtually to the arid desert and these boxes hold up. And I attribute um, the shaker design. I mean, I will go from 70, 80% humidity here to mm -hmm. I remember one time in Salt Lake City, it was 10%. Well, know? there's no cross grain. No, no. Yeah. So it, which it can it expand exactly. and contract, right? And uh, there's no glue, so that the the clinch nails, uh, they they can move exactly. with it. Exactly, and that is one of the reasons you know people ask, well, why did they? You think they did that? And the suspicion is, is for that very reason, for the expansion contraction, mm -hmm. and it just ended up having a an aesthetic look to it. Yeah. Well, it is beautiful, and that is just inspiring. Uh, I have never seen such uh, a, a creation of, of one's life work. I mean, that, well, that is you. something. Now, uh, this is pretty much traditional, but right. like you say, expanded out to sizes. Exactly. Just way off the charts, according to the shakers. Exactly. The, if you look at the very top and go down about three or four boxes, that being the the first one, and then you go down eight more additional boxes. Those were the boxes that I'm aware of mm -hmm. that the Shakers predominantly built, not only for their own use, but they would sell them out in the community mm -hmm. to uh, get hard cash. How would you like to be remembered as a, a woodworker, as an artist, or what? This might sound pretentious in some ways, but Really, the way I look at myself is, on my best day, a fairly good plagiarist. What I, what I, I, I did not come up with this, right. right? The Shakers came up with this beautiful, beautiful design. And I get the joy of, on a daily basis, you know, going into my shop and trying to recreate something that they meant for daily use. Mm -hmm. And it's such a beautiful, simple design, organic design. It's a joy to make something that's really can be used. It, uh, it can be put on a shelf and just sort of admired. I really prefer them to use it on, to put coffee in or stamps or whatever they want. Sort their stuff. Like exactly. The so um, I guess I really want to be known as a persistent, mediocre plagiarist. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> that's <laughs> a deal. All right, all right. Thank you. Later in the show, Tim Arnold takes us inside his workshop to show some of the steps he takes to make shaker-style oval boxes. But first, Popular Woodworking Magazine shows you how to make a stop block to safely cut boards on your table saw. Stick around, you're watching The Highland Woodwork. I'm just an average, down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here, and I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside Router Bits 
best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a white side router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. I've been using Forest products for years. You know, they're the maker of the Woodworker 2 saw blade. Gives great cuts on your table saw every time. Now, I have a chop master for my miter saw. I have a dense piece of two by two walnut, and as you see, it cuts like butter, leaving clean cuts at 90 degrees. Forest, the cuts will make you smile every time. Hey guys, Andrew here. Today I'm going to share with you a, a nice little table saw tip that's going to make you a safer table saw user. Uh, now today I'm going to be showing you how to rip really thin strips of wood on the table saw. Now you might be thinking, that's pretty simple, right? You want a quarter inch wide strip, adjust your fence to a quarter of an inch away from the blade, and rip your lumber. But as you can see, in order to get the fence uh, close enough to the blade to have a quarter inch slice of wood, you're not gonna be able to use your blade guard. That's not very safe. The other thing is that there's really no good way to clear the blade uh, after you're done making your cut. So it's very likely your cut could get pinched and uh, kick back at you. And kick back on a table saw is a very scary thing. So I do not recommend doing it this way. But what I do recommend is a simpler way and a safer way. Now the first thing we're going to do is put our guard back on the table saw. I always try to use a guard with my table saw and when I'm not using the guard I do use the riving knife. Now with the guard in place you can see we can't actually get close enough to the blade to make our thin cut. So the next thing you might think you want to do is I'll just have the off cut be on the outside of the blade. And I think you're onto something there. So if I wanted to cut a uh, quarter inch thick strip of wood here, I'd adjust my fence, make sure I'm lined up there, and make my cut. That works fine if you're just looking to cut one or two pieces, but what if you wanted to cut ten? Um, right now I'm thinking about making a whole bunch of runners for future table saw jigs, because I'm that table saw crazy. This isn't a very efficient way to do it, but if you add one other piece, a stop block, it's gonna make your life a lot easier. Now the stop block is really pretty simple. As the name implies, it's a block of wood that stops your workpiece. Setting it up is a little bit tricky. The best way I've found to do it is to actually uh, use a square that contacts the inside of your blade. Now I know this blade is an eighth of an inch thick, so I need um, to have my stop block be exactly an eighth of an inch plus whatever my cut is going to be. In this case, a quarter of an inch, one eighth plus one quarter, that's one eighth plus two eighths is three eighths. Now you can see on the stop block, I just have the corner of my piece of wood here, and that's gonna be my registration point um, for my repeatable cuts. And I want to align that to be 3 eighths of an inch away from the inside of my square here. And right now we're at about half inch or 4 eighths. And that looks pretty good. So 
So next, I'm just going to uh, clamp my stop block to the table of my table saw. This is actually uh, one of the trickier parts because there's not a very easy way to get a clamp on the front edge of a table saw. Um, but luckily, I've got a clamp that's deep enough to reach. And snug it up there. And I'll just come back here and make sure that I'm still where I want to be. About three eighths there. Now that I've got my stop block in place, I can take my piece of wood, which I have planed down to fit in my miter slots on my table to make runners. And I'll move the fence over so it just kisses the edge of my stop block. Like so. That looks pretty good. And I can start making my cuts. I'm just going to check the thickness of my off cut here. It's a little, it's a hair over a quarter of an inch, but that's good enough for what I'm doing. So, if I want to make another one of those, I just need to slide the fence over till my workpiece touches the stop block. Lock it in place. It's maybe a little snug there. And make my second cut. So there you have it, a easy, cheap, and most importantly safe way to cut a whole bunch of thin strips on your table saw. I'm going to keep rocking because I've got a bunch of jigs here to make, but I'm Andrew with Popular Woodworking, and we'll see you next time. Coming up, Tim Arnold shares some of his boxing moves. <laughs> Stay with us. You're watching The Highland Woodwork. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Well, this is the magic moment when my masterpiece or your masterpiece comes in contact with Masterpiece Wood Finish Oil. It just comes alive. This is a great piece of wood and it's going to just look brilliant. Masterpiece Wood Finish causes your masterpiece. Meet the Bora Centipede, the lightweight and portable workshop table that supports up to 3,000 pounds, stores in a small space for tight shops, and opens into a work table to bring your work to a comfortable height. This makes the perfect companion for your track saw. Comes with X cups and hold downs to secure your work. Upgrade your shop today. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading band saws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power Tools.
If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Let Highland's legendary wood slicer resaw blade help make it easy for you to get great results sawing thick lumber into thinner boards. The wood slicer is designed to cut much faster, smoother, and quieter than ordinary bandsaw blades. You'll be amazed at how smooth a surface you'll get with a wood slicer. Its variable tooth pattern greatly reduces noise and vibration. Order a wood slicer from Highland Woodworking for your bandsaw today. When I look closely at this, uh, as a woodworker, I see a lot of things I like and I see a lot of things that are kind of scary, sure. like this bin you right got it. here. Now, you got I it. bet you you can kind of lose it quickly. You can, and at times that will happen. Um, sometimes they're repairable, but at, at particularly with these very pinched elliptical ones, because the oh, this very sharp radius, you're asking a lot of the wood. Even after you've steamed the band and you have that 20 second window of somewhat malleable or plastic type properties in, in the wood, they can still snap on you. and. So if you have any short grain, you don't want it mm -hmm. here. No, no, sir. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Nope. Nope. And it will become. Aha. As we like, I, I like to say, BTUs for in the winter time. <laughs> so that's that's it's great. It's going to happen. It's yeah. going to happen. And just sort of zen out about it and move on. All right. So, but you've learned how to pick wood. Yes, and, and that helps. Um, and again, the nice gentleman, Mr. John Wilson, I buy the wood that he produces, and he's a master at um, preventing that happening before I even um, take uh, possession of this wood. Okay. All right. Well, tell me about how you do this. Sure. Um, so this is, the, this is the piece before it becomes um, this. And what I will use, I'll use this incredibly sophisticated template that I've cut out of an old business card. Mm -hmm. I'll use my mechanical pencil to, um, in essence, trace out the form. And that just gives me a general area of what I want to remove. Mm -hmm. At that point, I'll use one of these nice healthy knives that right. I've collected over the years. And I will just by hand, just start carving out the individual fingers. Mm -hmm. The other. Uh, point I will feather out the back end as you can see because obviously this is one piece of yeah. wood and this is something that we think that it's, we think is thin here there you go that yeah. the shakers did that just for aesthetics that you don't have an abrupt um, stop or stop and start mm -hmm. and then it's it's really just done for aesthetics now at that point after I've pre-drilled I also pre-drill um, all the the uh, nail holes because particularly on the ends there mm -hmm. if you don't you're going to split yeah. and sometimes mm -hmm. you will split yeah exactly sometimes and that I'll, I'll I'll try and work with and correct that but uh, it, it will still happen it's part of being a professional is is being able to take reality and and deal with it right and sometimes right. you can right sometimes you, you know what I you're right I think I'm a mediocre woodworker but I'm really good at correcting mistakes <laughs> well yeah you do a beautiful job well, thank Hi. you okay so imagine that band's cut out it's feathered out on the end and it's ready to go in the steam box so obviously um, uh, this band obviously is wet um, it's cut out and it's cooling, so I'm gonna put it back into the steam box before I bend it. But this, and the holes are pre-drilled, so it's ready to be bent. Now, let me put that back in there. And if it's, if it's okay, I'm gonna sit down because I need to have access to a few things here. <clears throat> this is a highly sophisticated and patented vise that I have here. And if um, I get 10% if anybody builds anything without my permission. All right. Okay. That, that's so. wonderful. So it's a vice. Yes, sir. You'll see. Yeah. You'll see here uh -huh. in just a second what I'm going to use it for. So at this point, I'm sort of under the clock. Mm -hmm. And I know just from experience, and I'll still have to correct it, where to place the beginning of the band. And then I wrap it around. And this water is very hot, and I've sort of gotten accustomed to it. But please, if it's too hot, use um, a good pair of pinchers 
to alleviate yourself of that pain. Now I'm just sort of holding it and I'm trying to center and as you can sort of see I'm not quite centered where I want to be. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to maintain pressure here but I'm going to shift the form a little bit to my left and reacquire the shape and I'm just looking for a centered look here. Mm -hmm. At this point, again, highly sophisticated, I put an indice mark so I can reestablish my lines mm -hmm. and I do this. I sort of just drop the form, I reestablish my indices, I get everything lined up the way I like it and here's my patented, okay. patented advice. So at this point, these are number two tacks. I, um, I probably could go with a smaller tax which you'll, you can possibly see over here. If you've gotten to this point, pretty much the stress is over with. There, there can still be problems, but they're pretty much over with. I just give it a light little tap just to get them started. And then as you can, you can hear that copper hitting the steel. And I'm gonna pull this off in just a second. And you can see how that's clenched over. Yeah. And you can take a breath at this point. You can get a sip of coffee. You can answer the phone. Is that right? Yeah. It, at this that's point, all you have left, yeah, right? Right. There. Exactly. And yeah. um, now, obviously, I wouldn't leave it like that. But the the stressful part, at least with mm -hmm. this band, is mm -hmm. pretty much over. Yeah. All so right. I'm, Looks like it's going to qualify. Huh? Well, I think so. Yeah. We're, let's go ahead and finish it up. And. Um, put the remaining tacks in, flip it over, up. One of the many things I love about Cherry is the marbling, the, the tannin lines. Oh yeah. And I, I think it just gives it such character. So I'm going to put it back on that same form. I might adjust it just a little bit. It's not quite centered. Where I want it. Here we go. All right. So that is the bottom band. I can do the top band if you'd like me to uh, put the top band on it. Now there's a piece that's going to go here to, to fill up the void. Is that right? Um, on the regular boxes, mm -hmm. uh, on the regular oval boxes, exactly. I use shapers. I see. On these guys, because they're pinched, very pinched, elliptical mm -hmm. shape, I just put them right back on the original forms and I let them dry on that. This is a double tall number two. So, I, I steamed these yesterday, and these could be a booger, and, th and this is where taller boxes can um, get a little bit intimidating, because what you wanna do is, you saw me support those fingers. Right. You want your, your hand, when you're steaming that band, and it comes out, and you got that 20 or 15 second window to, to you know, mm -hmm. cut bait or you know fish or whatever. Right. Um, you got to you got to support that band, and I and it. You really use. That's yeah. Yeah, my wife. Your apron. Ten years ago, said I'm tired of you destroying shirts. Right. I'm try. I'm tired of trying to clean them. Would mm -hmm. you please find something? So, th this is not for show. This this is really used. Right. And daily. it's reinforced. It is. Yeah. It is. Uh -huh. um, so it's it's not. Uh, it literally and. The first thing I do in the morning, I turn on the lights, I put this on. At the end of the day, I take this off and turn off the lights. So this is kind of your workbench in a it way. Was. Yeah. And, and it's getting bigger every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I established my indices again right here. You, can, you might be able to see, um, and this, of course, is a dried box, but you might be able to see, and you can see my dirty fingernail um, right there. And at that point, I'll support it. I'll bring it over to my patent advice, and I'll put in the tax. And I will. And it's it's wavy gravy too. It does not have a nice elliptical shape at this point. So that's where the shapers are critical. I get it in there. And actually, this is pretty dry for being under 24 hours, and we're at 60% humidity. That's not too bad. And as you can see, um, the tax are still proud because. When I, uh, when I hammered this in, it was a completely soaked piece of wood. And so the wood has constricted. And so 
the nails, as you can might be able to see, are a little proud. So one of the first things I'll do when I'm ready to take it to the next step, I'll put it back on the vise and just tap in the tacks, just a little, get them a little bit tighter, uh -huh. and get this space in between the tip of the finger and the base of the, uh, the band, however you want to describe it. Well, Tim, that was a great amount of information about a subject that I have always been interested in shaker boxes you're the guy thank you sir i really appreciate it oh it was wonderful i mean yeah i just keep uh going back to the those fingers and the bending is all there wow you're warned they are addictive if you start one you will not end with just one i can't wait to try for 30 years i was a garage woodworker and Everything in that shop had to be collapsible, on wheels, mobility, and flexibility was the standard. And nothing has changed. Uh, today, I've got a, a great large shop here, but everything is mobile. Well, this is the answer in versatility and mobility. This is the Bora Centipede portable work stand. This one is the 9S, which uh, will support a four by four uh, work area. I'll just throw a piece of plywood up here. And now I've got a, a big work table, a table to put together uh, a, a project. Uh, and I can put it anywhere I want to put it. The Bora Centipede is gonna be so useful in your shop. There's so many things you can do with it. You can uh, set up a track saw and cut an extremely wide board. You could use this as a surface for a portable power tool, like maybe a miter saw. You can cut and trim a big slab right on this surface because it will hold up to 3,500 pounds. This is something that you've just got to have in your shop the other day, I put a piece of plywood up here and did an assembly for a project right here. And I could have done that anywhere I wanted to because the Boris Centipede is just that versatile. Well, there is a Boris Centipede size just right for your shop. It comes in a two by four, a four by four, and this is the four by four unit. It also comes in a four by six and a four by eight. And now there are 24 inch by 48 inch sections of tabletop with dog holes that just make its usefulness unlimited. With the four x four unit, you get four of the quick clamps and you get four of the X cups. The X cups allow you to put two by fours uh, to create an infrastructure for supporting your work and the quick clamps allow you to clamp it down for safety and ease as you work on your project. And now you've got uh, 24 by 48 inch uh, sections of uh, bench top that you can add to yours. You could cover the whole thing using several of those, those sections and they've got dog holes in them and dogs are available to, to really dress out your Bora Centipede Portable Workstation. I guarantee you, it'll make you smile. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of The Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's about all the time we have left for this episode of The Highland Woodworker. Don't forget to follow us on our social media channels. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.